Let's log into Psalm. Turn to page number 243. Page number 243. Let's all stand and sing victory in Jesus. 243. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood atoning Pitted of my sin and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. And he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him. And all my love is to Him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing blood. I heard about His healing, of His cleansing power revealing. How He made the lame to walk again. And cause the blind to see. And then I cried, Dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus my Savior forever. He sought me, and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath thy cleansing I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. The streets of gold beyond the crystal sea, about the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the glancing blood. Amen. Turn to page number 75. Page number 75. On Jordan's stormy banks I stand and stow wishful life to Canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie. I am bound for the promised land. I am bound for the promised land. Oh, who will come? And go with me, I am bound for the promised land. All o'er those wide extended plains shine 
eternal day. Their God, the sun, forever reigns and scatters night away. For the promised land, I am bound for the promised land. Oh, who will come and go with me? I am bound the promised land. When shall I reach that happy place and be forever blessed? When shall I see my Father's face and in His bosom rest? I am bound for the promised land. I am bound for the promised land. Oh, who will come and go with me? I am bound for the promised land. Amen. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we thank you this morning for your blessings. We thank you for the privilege of again to be in your house on this Lord's day. And Father, as we pray, uh, Lord, about the service this morning, I pray that each and every one of us will come with an attitude of, of worshiping and praising your name today. Lord, what uh, two of the greatest songs that we've already sung this morning, uh, Victory in Jesus. Lord, I'm so thankful, uh, Lord, that uh, 43 years ago, past Thursday, uh, Lord, that uh, I came to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of my life. I've not forgotten it. Uh, I've not uh, regretted it. Uh, Lord, it's been a thrill know you and to get to know you in, in, in that personal, intimate way. Father, I pray there's somebody here this morning that does not know Jesus as Lord and Savior of their life and not leave this service without it. And then, Lord, also, I am bound to the promised land. Jesus tells us in John 14, uh, he says, let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in my Father's house and many mansions. Lord, I'm so I, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you if I go. I prepare a place for you I will. Lord, uh, you are coming again. Uh, we, we don't know the day, we don't know the hour, but we do know your promise. Uh, and we can't lie. So we thank you for that promise of knowing that we're headed towards that promised land uh, with you in heaven today. Heavenly Father, I pray that we can come to you. We worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray, Father, for those that may be here this morning or some that are out sick. Uh, Lord, I just pray that you touch bodies, you and raise them up. Uh, Lord, and get them back in the service as quickly as possible. Some are traveling. Uh, Lord, we pray for family mercy and grace. Lord, some have lost loved ones. Uh, Lord, I just pray for those families that, uh, Lord, are grieving at this time. And then, Lord, some are uh, at work. Uh, because it's not required to be there, I pray, Father, to give them, uh, Lord, uh, grace, protection, Lord, on the job today. And then, Father, they have opportunity uh, to share the truth in the Word of God with some of their co workers, uh, Lord, during a break or during lunchtime, Lord, uh, that they have that opportunity. Thank you for what you've done for us. We thank you for what you've given us. And more importantly, Lord, we love you. Uh, we thank you for what you've done this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning and welcome to the Sunday morning services of Garth Road Baptist Church. It's nothing like getting up in the morning and being reminded you have victory in Jesus and you're bound for the promised land. Uh, good, good choices, Steve. That's really good. If you will, uh, I'll ask you to turn to Psalm 108 just for a second, and I'll read it very quickly. I'm going to look at the first six um, verses here. It says, O oh God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise, even with my glory. Awake, psaltery, and harp. I myself will awake early. I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people. I will sing praises unto thee among the nations. For thy mercy is great above the heavens, and thy truth reaches under the clouds. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens, and thy glory above all the earth. That thy beloved may be delivered, save with thy right hand, and answer me. That is a picture of worship. That is a beautiful picture of worship. When you look at that, what David is doing here, he's doing what we're here today for. Um, he's here to worship God, and he's here to pray to God. And then finally, he's here anxiously waiting to hear from God. And that's a beautiful picture of, of, of us here at Garth Road Baptist Church this morning. If you're home, folk, it's good to see you. If you're a visitor, we hope that you received one of these cards as you came in and filled it out. 
If you didn't, if you wouldn't mind reaching into the receipt in front of you in the, in the pocket, you'll find one. If you would fill it out for us and put it in the offering place that comes by, we would love to have a record of your visit here today. Uh, moving to our announcements, as always, Sunday school starts at 10 a.m. And I uh, really encourage everyone to go to Sunday school. It's where we really dig into the Word of God. And it's where you can get some good questions asked and answered. We, we had a wonderful discussion today on the fact today that God can't lie. In fact, the, the pastor mentioned it this morning in, in his prayer. Our worship service is at 11 a.m. Our evening service is at 6 p.m. For the, the being, we're going to be going back to 5 p.m. beginning, beginning November the 1st. Uh, Wednesday evening service is at 7 p.m. Looking forward at what we have going on, Saturday, August 29th, Adult 1 and 2 Sunday School Class Fellowship at 6 p.m. That's going to be a lot of fun. That's going to be game. Now, we invite everybody to come out to that. If you like playing games and eating, you're going to have a good time. <laughs> and I, I can highly recommend it. Uh, Sunday, August 30th, there's going to be a men's meeting following the evening service in the Adult 1 classroom. I wouldn't mind staying for a little while to discuss some things. Sunday, September 6th, is going to be a covered dish supper following the evening service. It's going to be a wonderful time of fellowship. Again, we invite everyone to attend. And then Monday, September the 8th, is Labor, is Labor Day holiday. We wish everyone a wonderful Labor Day holiday. Thank you for being here today. Let's worship the Lord. Turn to page number 29. Page number 29. Let's all stand, please. Page number 29. Alas, I did, Savior, bleed. I did, my sovereign, die. Would he devote that sacred head such a worm as I At the cross, at the cross I first saw the light And the burden of my heart rolled away It was there by faith I received my sight Now I am happy all the day Was it for crime I have done he groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. At the cross where I first saw the light, the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight. Now I am happy all the day, but drops of grief ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give self away all that I can do. At the cross, at the cross, Burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith, received my sight. Now I am happy all the day. Turn to page number 250. 250, we'll ask some men to come forward to see the offering on the last course. Page number 250, burdens are lifted at Calvary. Days are filled with sorrow and care. Hearts are lonely and drear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very Burdens are lifted at Calvary, <coughs> Calvary. Burdens are lifted 
Lord at Calvary. Thus is very near. Cast your care on Jesus today. Leave your worry and fear. Guns are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Troubled soul, the Savior can see. Every heartache and tear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Hands are lifted at Calvary. Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. I don't often ask you to do this, but you please grab your Bible real quick. Turn to the book of First Chronicles, chapter 29. The book of First Chronicles, chapter 29. I want to make sure we're all looking at this. While you're finding First Chronicles 29, if you've had the experience of knowing when the cross was really near you so you could accept Jesus Christ, say amen this morning. Praise God. If you couldn't say amen right there, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, there will be an opportunity at the end of the service don't pass it up. I have heard people say, I've lost faith. I've heard people say, I've changed my faith. I've never had anybody say, I'm sorry I got saved. Never heard that. Book of First Chronicles, chapter 29. Still hear some pages rustling. I'll find something else to uh, just ramble about for a second. Yes, sir, I am good at that. First Chronicles, chapter 29, verse 6. The Word of God says, Then the chief of the fathers and princes of the tribes of Israel, and the captains of the thousands and of the hundreds, with the rulers of the king's work, offered, what's that next word? Willingly. And gave for the service of the house of God of gold 5,000 talents, and 10,000 grams, and of silver 10,000 talents, and of brass 18,000 talents, and 100,000 talents of iron, and they with whom precious stones were found gave them to the treasures of the house of the Lord by the hand of Jehel the Gershonite. Then the people rejoiced for that they offered, what's that word? Willingly, because with perfect heart they offered, what's the word? Willingly to the Lord. Not to the church, not to a man, to the Lord. And David the king also rejoiced with great joy. One of the great themes in the Bible is that God does not force himself on anyone. He wants you to choose him, but he will not walk you in a cage and berate you or hurt you or pound on you until you choose him. He is not in the brainwashing business. He is not in the stealing business. He will not break into your home and steal your valuables until you pay his tithe. He says, if you love me, obey my commandments. One of the commandments of the Lord is to tithe. You're not tithing to this church. You're not tithing to this man. You're tithing to the Lord God Almighty. Now that money will be used to upkeep this property for the lights, for the praise God air conditioner, 
And if you give beyond that, outside of tithe, into offerings, what we do is we take those and we, we print gospel tracts. We have services such as uh, the jail ministry, such as the Swan Manor ministry, where we go into nursing homes and uh, preach the gospel to the folks that are there and encourage them and, and teach them, as well as the RU ministry, one of the greatest ministries, taking people who are broken who are at the end of everything, who have addictions, hooks in them so strong that nothing they think can get them out. We take them to the one person who can, Jesus Christ. That's what, you, when you give to the Lord through this church, that's where your money goes. Be up front with it. That's what we do. And as we have this opportunity right now to give to the Lord through your tithes and offerings, remember this is a time of honoring God through your finances. And as we take up the offering, I'm going to ask my brother Kyle to use something. To help me follow the Lord, so I just want to thank you for bringing us here this morning, Lord. I want to thank you for uh, bringing those who Lord, I just pray that you'll uh, uh, put a special blessing on them, Lord, that uh, this message will be something that they will come here to hear. You know, if uh, people come here for a message from you, Lord, and I know that uh, this is a place that we can get true doctrine from God. I just pray that you'll uh, wrap those in and uh, give the Holy Spirit, Lord, that it be very prevalent, Lord, that uh, the message you receive is from the Bible and from you. I just pray that uh, you'll give us something that we can use for the rest of this day, for the rest of this week. Lord, I just want to pray for this offering we're about to receive, Lord. I just pray that you'll bless it, you with your honor and your glory, Lord. As I know that you don't care on a thousand years, Lord, this is already yours. And I just pray that uh, as we give thanks to you, that you've already given us, Lord, that it be used in the, in the way that you see fit. Lord. I just pray that you'll guide the hands of those that are in control of the finances. I pray that you'll guide the hands of those that are in control of this uh, church that you've given. Guide them and direct them uh, in your path. Please allow us to be a shining light for those that are lost. And I pray all these things in the precious blood of Christ Jesus. See the day when you come to kneel and pray. I never thought that I would see the church house filled to capacity and outside the door there's more. Who have never come before. Oh, what a shame that Jesus came one day before. And you came one day to lay. One day. 
to let Jesus came and you've been left behind to wait yesterday you couldn't find time for Jesus on your mind you finally came to call his name but one day to lay. You try to live the best you could. Try to do the things you should. But when it came to serving God, you said, I still have time to wait. Now it's all turned around. Time to serve him. Now you found how sad the fate. You found the time one day too late. And you came one day too late. One day too late, Jesus came, and you've been left behind to wait. Yesterday, you could I for Jesus on your mind. You finally came to call his name, but one day to lay. One day to lay. after opportunity is presented to folks and, and put it off, put it off. The greatest lie of Satan is you've got plenty of time. You know, young people tend to think, well, you know, I'm young. When I get older, when I was in uh, junior high school in Oxnard, California, years and years and years ago, I had a young man that uh, was my best friend. saved at that time, so I can't say I tried to witness to him or anything like that, but death for young people came really real to me at that time because he was killed in an automobile accident and I was returned. And that was it. Fourteen years old. We don't know the day, we don't know the hour that our death is going to take place. That's why God says in our in Hebrews, the book that we're studying, um, now is the accepted time for that. The day is the day of salvation. Don't put it off and be one day too late. If you want to take your Bible, turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter number 13. Hebrews, chapter number 13. We're almost finished with the book of Hebrews. We started back in March, so uh, I've rushed right on through and uh, uh, try to get this. Now, while you're turning to Hebrews chapter number 13, I will tell you and I will apologize. Uh, yesterday we were out knocking doors, talking to people about the Lord, and uh, if most of you know, we had a, a horrible rain come, come up and right over where I was at. And uh, Brother Ronnie was with me and uh, he needed to get to the truck because he had a hearing aid. And uh, so I gave him my keys. I said, you go to the truck. We only have just a few houses left. And so I continued in the rain. And uh, so my throat is scratchy, my head is stopped up, and uh, I'll probably somewhere along the line start coughing. Uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and, and apologize. I'm sorry. I can't do anything about it. Uh, I'm praying the Lord will take care of my voice throughout the message. And uh, 
And so I have my cough drop, so it sounds like my words are slurred. That's the reason why. Okay, try to calm my throat a little bit. I have my water to drench it if I need to. And uh, you just pray for me. All right, Hebrews chapter number 13. Uh, there's three verses I'm going to read this morning. I invite you to stand with me in the reverence of the reading of the Word of God. And uh, we'll have prayer, and then you may be seated after that. Notice, if you will, verse number 7. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Verse number 17, Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they uh, that must give account, that they must uh, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Verse number 24, salute all of them that have the rule over you, and all the saints, they of Italy, salute you. I'm going to call your attention back to verse number 17, and that phrase, uh, they watch for your soul. They watch for your souls. I'm going to speak to you this morning on the subject, the shepherd of your soul. The shepherd of your soul. Let's pray. Father, as we bow before you again this morning, we ask for your blessings upon the reading and upon the teaching of the Word of God. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would use me today in your in your service. Uh, Lord, that the Holy Spirit of God would speak through me, that I'd not say anything that would be uh, a hurt or detriment, Lord, uh, uh, to the uh, Word of God. Uh, Lord, that I would not uh, say anything, Lord, that is not true according to the Word of God. Uh, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would guard my thoughts, guard my mind, uh, Lord, I pray that uh, that my heart would be cleansed of anything that would be a hindrance or to uh, the preaching of the Word of God this morning. In turn, I pray that each and every one that's here this morning would listen to the Word of God uh, as uh, as it is the Word of God in truth. As Jesus tells us in uh, John 17, 17, uh, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. And then in John chapter 8, verse 32, Jesus says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. In John chapter 14, and verse number 6, uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, he is the truth. And so as we open the word of God this morning, it is the truth of the word of God. Father, I pray that uh, each and every one of us would listen intently to the words as, as the Holy Spirit nudges us, whether it be for salvation, whether it be for a sin in our lives, or whether it be, uh, or that somebody uh, that we know is dying and going to hell. Uh, we'd not want them to meet that fate as, as Brother Steve sang that song at uh, one day too late. Father, bless the service today. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you. And you may be seated. This is the second in, in a uh, some three, uh, three verses that we have been talking about. Uh, we've, we've dealt with them individually, or are dealing with them individually. Uh, John cha or Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 7 says, Remember them which have the rule over you. And most commentators will believe that that's those in the past. And, of course, uh, that would definitely be uh, a truism in that uh, those that were a part of my life as a child of God once I got saved, uh, Brother Bill Riddick was, a, was my pastor, and as a uh, pastor, uh, he taught me a lot of things from the Word of God. Uh, he taught me about uh, believing the Bible, that the Bible was the Word of God. He taught me that Jesus Christ was uh, Lord and Savior, that he was the creator of the heavens and the earth. He taught us that he was virgin born. And, and all of these things that he built, but built, built the foundation upon which I stand. Then, uh, not too long after I got saved, I got saved on August 20th of 1972. And then we moved to Baytown in March of 1973. So I wasn't under his tutelage, under his mentorship for, for a long time. I moved to Baytown. We joined the Garth Road Baptist Church. Do the math. <laughs> I've been here for a very long time. I started out as a, as a literally as a 16-year-old young man. Uh, we moved here. I've been working in Mississippi. I've been working uh, in the, you know, I'm from Mississippi, right? When I don't say all the syllables, uh, from Mississippi. Uh, when we moved here. Uh, I, uh, I had been involved in the bus ministry. I've been involved in soul winning. We went to the hospital. Uh, either in, in uh, Biloxi or Pascagoula, every Friday night. Uh, we did uh, uh, youth programs, vacation Bible schools. We did four a year, uh, four vacation Bible schools a year because of where we were at, uh, we were located between Biloxi, Ocean Springs, uh, Pascagoula, and uh, North Biloxi. 
and so we 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 did a, a, a vacation Bible school for each one of those groups, and we bused them in. Uh, we ran a bus bus ministry of 23 buses uh, at that particular time. So I was highly involved with children's church, with Sunday school, with all that. At 16 years old, just as a young Christian, I moved here. God had called me to preach in December of 1972. We moved here. Uh, Brother Ed Weatherly was is also my mentor. He was my pastor for 44 years. Uh, well, he was the pastor here for 44 years. He was my pastor from 1972 until he died in 05. Uh, but he was my mentor. I, I started out with the bus ministry, Sunday school, those types of things I've already been doing. And then in 1985, uh, he asked me to be the associate pastor for the Garth Road Baptist Church. And for, uh, for that 20 years, I was associate pastor. Ten years ago, October of 2005, I became the pastor. So I've been here for a long time. And not only that, but I've, I've, I've had mentors. I've had men who have developed me and helped me uh, in the ministry to be where I'm at today. Uh, it's very uncommon for someone to be an associate pastor for 20 years. But that's the way God wanted it. And he was grooming me, I think, to take this position uh, at, that I've had for these last 10 years. Not only did I, did I have my father-in-law, I also had uh, great men of God, uh, like Dr. Jack Hiles and, uh, and Dr. Curtis Hudson and Dr. Uh, John R. Rice, and I'm dating myself now with some of these guys, uh, Dr. Lee Robertson, and, and, and these men whom I studied and whom I heard preached numerous times uh, that developed me into what I am today as far as the Bible is concerned. So when the Bible says, remember them which have the rule over you, uh, it, it, it's good to remember those who have helped you, have mentored you, have given you uh, 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 Bible strength and, and, and trained you and taught you. That's good. But also, I think remembering them is to remember those who are also involved uh, in your daily lives, uh, pastors that uh, that you've been under, or or great uh, uh, men of God. There's some great women uh, that are great teachers of the Word of God. I'm not talking about uh, as pastors, but in Sunday school classes, as uh, as examples and those types of things. In fact, the Bible teaches us in Titus that the older women are to teach the younger women. Uh, I think the older women ought to mentor. Uh, the younger women uh, within the church. I think that's important. Uh, the older gentlemen should should work with the younger uh, men uh, in the church and help them and teach them and train them. I think we need to remember them also. And notice what he says in verse number 7. It's not just remembering them, but notice what it says uh, there. He says, uh, that have spoken unto you the word of God. Who have spoken unto you the word of God. If they have been preaching the word of God, if they have been teaching the word of God, then you need to remember them. Not only that, but he says, whose faith follow. Uh, you know, Brother Kurt mentioned a while ago, he said, I've heard of people who, who have uh, lost their faith. Okay? I've, I've seen of people who uh, have, uh, have, uh, have, have maybe left their faith, but none that have ever regretted the fact that they are saved. You know, in 43 years, I've not been perfect. I wish, Lord, I had been. But it hasn't happened that way. Uh, I'm human, just like you are. Uh, but I remember the teachings that I learned from the Word of God. When I read the Bible and I study the Bible, uh, I remember that, and I, I have followed that uh, in my Christian life, follow faith, but also uh, there, not only that, but he says in the last part of that verse, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. The word conversation in King James is, in the, is an old English word. When we talk about conversation, we talk about talk, conversing together, talking to one another. But this, in the context here, he's talking about their manner of life. Your pastor, your mentors, your teachers ought to follow Christ. I'll put it this way. Follow me as I follow Christ. My life as a pastor should be an example to the believer. That's what the Bible says. My life should be an example to the believer. Uh, if, you, if you follow me, I, I pray that you're following me in the right way. If you're following me because of who I am, if you follow me and, and submitting to what I preach simply because uh, you want to please me, then you're doing it the wrong way. My job is to guide you, to lead you through the Holy Spirit of God to do what the Bible says. And that's the, my only purpose. That's my only plan. Uh, my job is, is to train you and teach you, but my life should be an example. Now, let me put this, this parenthesis here. I do not believe in a lifestyle evangelism. Okay, you say, what's lifestyle evangelism? Lifestyle evangelism is you walk around with a big smile on your face and, 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 and you say glory and you say praise the Lord and, 
and people are just going to look at you and they're just going to fall at your feet asking to be saved. I don't believe that. The Bible says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Our job is to go out into the world. That's what I was doing yesterday with several of our people, knocking on doors, talking to people about the Lord. And it's interesting to note that on the street that we were working on yesterday uh, and, and last week, last week I had a young man, I knocked on the door, he came to the door, and I, I told him who I was, and, he, and the first thing he says, man, this must be of God. He said, my, 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 I, I was just sitting there, and I was thinking, hey, Lord, I need to get, I need to get right with God. I need to get in the church. I need, and he said, here you come knocking on my door and, and talking to me about church. That, that must be a sign that I'm supposed to be in your church. Yesterday, we're knocking on doors, and, and, and I knock on this one door, Brother Ronnie and I did. This lady comes to the door, she opens the door, and I tell her who I am, and same reaction. My husband and I were just sitting in here talking about we need uh, to find a church. And here, this must be a sign from God. See, too many times we look at, well, nobody's interested in church, nobody's interested in getting saved, nobody's... <laughs> no, we're just not doing our job. It's our responsibility to go. Now, lifestyle evangelism doesn't really get people saved. Now, I've had numbers of people. I'll be in the hospital or I might be uh, at a job site or something. People look at me and go, are you a preacher? Guilty as charged. Yes, I am. Is it because I'm wearing a suit and a tie and all that kind of thing? Not always. Sometimes I might just have a Garth Road Baptist Church uh, polo on. Sometimes I may just be dressed casually and somebody looks at me and goes, are you a preacher? I don't know how they know that kind of stuff. But I've never had any of them just come to me and go, hey, I know you're a preacher, and I want to get saved right now. You, <laughs> I've never had that. I've been saved for 43 years. I don't know if anybody else has had that experience, but I think that we should. our manner of life should be an example to the believers. I think that everywhere we go, uh, when you go to a restaurant, you sit down, and, and the waitress is having a bad day, and, uh, and then you make it worse by griping and, and running her ragged and all of those things, and then you leave her a penny tip and a gospel track, I want to kick you in the shin. I, I, I'm not a violent person, but that is not a godly example. And if you leave a track like that, leave it for Brother Isaiah's church, uh, uh, Iglesia Baptista Victoria. Brother Isaiah will appreciate that. Leave one of his tracks if you're going to do something like that. In fact, I have a few of them if you'd like to borrow some. You know, let him think that his people, now Brother Isaiah and I are very good friends. We, we share uh, his children Become, have become our grandchildren. But let me tell you, uh, it ought to be an example of the believer. Now, secondly, we come into verse number 17. Notice what he says, obey them that have the rule over you. Obey them. Now, there's a couple of things about this, this verse that I want you to, to draw your attention to. First of all, who is to obey? Who is to obey? obey. It doesn't say you obey, okay? It just says obey. Now, we, 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 we have an understood subject here. <laughs> Going back to my grammar days and teaching grammar in, in, uh, in high school here, you is understood. And so what Paul the writer is saying, you obey them that have the rule over you. Okay? That's a command. That's just like you, you tell your children. You don't say, you know, at our house, we only had Michael for, uh, for a long time. And so my wife starts at Steve her oldest brother, and goes to her younger brother, John, and then to me, and then to Michael. You would think you only have one child, so, you know, it should be easier. You know, now we go through five people before we finally get to the one that we want to talk to, uh, or talk about it, you know, address. Now, here it's understood. You don't, you don't tell your child and call all five of them by name and go, you, you, and you, you go clean your room. Now what you say, go clean your room. That's command. You expect them to do something, right? Okay. How many have ever told your children, obey me? Obey me. Okay? Paul is saying, obey them that have the rule over you. Now, you, you go, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What, what are we talking about in obeying? Well, the word in the Greek, uh, and I'll not give you the Greek word, but I'll, I'll just kind of, it, it means to persuade. When I tell my son, I want you to do this, I expect them to obey me. I have persuaded them. Can I just tell you this? This is free. This won't cost you a dime. You don't even have to leave me a penny uh, uh, underneath the chair. 
But when you tell your child to do something, it should be immediate obedience. I'm not telling you again to do I'm not telling you again to I'm not telling you again. You've just told them three times. It's immediate obedience. Go do it. And if they don't go do it, then discipline should be administered. It should be, I mean, it's not always spanking. What is their currency? Some kids have been spanked so much, it's just like, okay. They walk around like this all the time because they know they're going to get it. It doesn't change the attitude. It doesn't change the heart. It doesn't change the behavior. It, it's because they're so used to it. But you take that iPhone. You pull those video games. I have one parent, my child just will not listen to me. And they go in the room and they slam the door. I said, there would be no door on it to slam. There would ask to be no door. There's hinges on that door. You could take that those hinges off. You could store the door in the garage. The Bible says, uh, the law says you have to provide them shelter, you have to provide them clothing, you have to provide them food. Clothing is not the the top of the line stuff either. Jeans from Walmart, ten dollar jeans are okay. Five dollar tennis shoes are fine. You go in there and clean them room out, their room out and you give them the things that they don't like, I'll guarantee they'll start to listen to you. That was all free. You don't have to leave me a penny for it, okay? Now, the truth is we are to obey. Now, the word there means to persuade them to do what you're supposed, they're supposed to do. That's persuade. Okay. Secondly, it means be persuaded. To be persuaded to suffer oneself, to be persuaded. In other words, I'm going to submit myself. I'm going, in fact, the word submit is in there, but but I'm going to, I'm persuaded that what they're trying to do is going to be helpful to me. It's going to be a benefit to me. When I got saved, I, I had an awful life. I was 16 years old, but believe me, I was no saint. In fact, I told somebody last week, I had to get hold of about vocabulary. And my mother never heard my vocabulary, but all my friends did. And I had to get a new vocabulary. I mean, I had to, I had some words that peeled paint off the wall. I mean, it, they were awful. I had to get a new vocabulary. I had to had to get a, a new drink. <coughs> I had to get a new drink. I had to get a new drink. Hello? I had to get a new attitude. Because I had a stinking 16-year-old attitude. And I'd just wait for somebody. I told the kids in school, in school the other day, attitude is like a flat tire. You're going nowhere until it gets changed. You say, what do you mean by that? Yes. Yes. Stop. Yeah. You're not going out of the house until that attitude changes. You ain't doing anything until that attitude changes. It means to believe. It means to be persuaded of a thing concerning a person. It means to listen to, obey, yield to, comply with, to trust, to have confidence in, to be confident. I mean, to have confidence in. If you do not have confidence in the person who's trying to to, uh, to uh, be a leader to you, then you're in the wrong place. You're in the wrong place. You need to, and, and what he's saying here is submit to them to have the rule over you. We're, we're not talking about a dictatorship here. Okay, a dictator says, I will control you. That's a dictator. A leader says, let's do it this way. Let's follow this path. Let's listen to what the Bible says here. That, that's a leader. The other is a dictator. I, I was telling you, uh, I think a couple of weeks ago, that that uh, I know a pastor that, I mean, in his church, and he's going to give an account. We're going to talk about that in a minute for what he does. But, I mean, he controls everybody on his staff. They can't have TVs. They can't have uh, their, women, their, their, their wives cannot wear uh, legged pajamas to bed. I mean, he's got all of these rules. Folks, that's not my responsibility. I am not a dictator. I'm a sinner saved by grace, just like you're a sinner saved by grace. My responsibility is to teach you what the Bible says. The Holy Spirit's responsibility is to tell you this is what you need to do, and you need to comply to it. Now, when he's talking about 
about obeying, he's talking about having confidence in what the teacher, the leader is saying, is part of the word of God, and you're going to follow that word. Obedience here is more about being persuaded. As a member of the church, submitting yourself to the pastor's leadership means that you are persuaded that he has your best interest at heart. Why do you want your children to obey you? Because you have their best interest at heart. If you have a swimming pool in your backyard, you have a lock on, on, the, on the back door, hopefully that, that, that a young child couldn't get out and fall in that pool and drown. You've got a fence around that pool so that you can't, the kids in the neighborhood aren't going to get in there and, and drown. Are you doing that because you don't want them to have fun in a swimming pool? No, you want to protect them. And that's what rules are. They're protection. They're, they're not, they're not uh, uh, something designed to cause you to have misery. So submit. Secondly, he says to resist no longer is what that means. To give, uh, to, but to give way, yield your combatant. Paul says it this way in Romans chapter number 7. The things that I want to do, I don't do. Now, I want to be 157 pounds. I'm about uh, 50 pounds from that. Now, actually 40 pounds. Give myself credit here. 40 pounds. And so, over that. Now, honestly, that's what I want. But I have this addiction. It's called sweets. It's called food. Back a year ago, I went to the doctor, and I had lost down to 187 pounds, and he was told, all right, Jim, you're doing great. Went to the doctor back in May, and he goes, um, yes, sir, I'm working on it. So, I mean, the things that I want to do, I don't do. The things that I don't want to do, those are the things I do. I mean, Man, that cheesecake last night was awesome. I don't know if you've ever had that salted caramel truffle blizzard from uh, from uh, Dairy Queen, but I can't walk into Dairy Queen without walking out. With it. I'm telling you right now, it's just awesome. Okay, they need to take that one off the market, or I'm going to be 300 pounds before long. I mean, it is awesome. Now, the things that I don't want to do, those things that I do, the things that I, I that I that I want to do, I don't do those things. And Paul says, oh, wretched man that I am. Who's going to deliver me from this? He says, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. We have an awesome God that delivers us from these things. Now, submission. Many times when, uh, uh, when we, if we hear something that we disagree with, the first thing we want to do is tend to ignore it. <laughs> kind of like your kids. They're playing video games, and you say, I need to put that video game down to come to supper. Two minutes later, I said, put that video game down. But I guarantee you, they can be in their room with the door closed. Their TV on. Headphones on. And you look at your wife and you say, I think, let's, let's go to uh, uh, Chili's uh, for, uh, for supper tonight. And immediately they're, boom, right there. You didn't even say it loud enough. You didn't holler. Why is it that they can hear going to Chili's when they can't hear turn that off and come to the supper? Because they have selective hearing. And that's what we, we tend to ignore what we're not interested in at that particular time. Okay? Now, the, secondly, not only do we tend to ignore, but we also decide not to submit to something that we don't agree with. Hello? Go clean your room. I don't agree with that. I have everything categorized. Let me give you an example. I'm, 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 my wife will tell me about all this when I get home. You could have left that story out. And we could have got that 30 minutes earlier. I used to work for Foley's, and, and I have a way of filing things. If you see my desk, I have a way of filing things. They're piles. There's nothing in a, in a folder. It's, it's all piled up. You say, can I have, do you know where such such is? I can pull it out just like that. I worked at Foley's. We ha I had a, a head stack. So I went on vacation, and I came back. And all of my stacks were gone. And then my supervisor came in and says, uh, Jim, I need this paper. I'm going, I don't know where it's at. 
What do you mean you don't know where it's at? I said, it was right here in this pile right here. I could have pulled it out and given it to you just like that. But somebody decided to file all of my stuff, and I don't know where they filed it, so I don't know where it is. I mean, kids look, I have this all stuff categorized. My shoes are underneath my bed. My, my, my underwear is in the bottom of the closet. I know where everything is. And the parents go in and clean them. I can't find nothing. That's what they think. No, we, we have a better idea for that. Now then, what is the pastor's job? Pastor is the shepherd of the sheep. David was a shepherd. David was a protector of his sheep. He killed a, a lion. He killed a bear. I mean, he was the one that was, was a, an example of what it was he was supposed to do. He was a shepherd. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. All right? Uh, David, as a shepherd, became one of the greatest kings known to the Israel, Israelites. Why? Because he had the foundation of what a shepherd was. And he wrote that great song, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He goes through there, saying, Lord God is that. Jesus talks about it in John chapter number 10, verses 11 through 14. He talks about the fact that, that there are hirelings out there. A hireling is the person that's hired to do a job, and that's all they're going to do is their job. They're not going to get involved with anything. They're not going to do anything other than what they have to do. They, if their problems come, they're up and they're gone. I've been in the ministry for 40-plus years, and I will tell you what happens is this. When the going gets tough, you can tell whether the pastor's there to stay or the pastor's there to just for a paycheck. When the pastor up and leaves, like with his, he's just there for the paycheck. Because all of us are going to have difficulties and struggles all the time. Human nature. My father-in-law pastored this church for 44 years. And believe me, in 44 years, and a lot of that, I was there with him. He just never gave up. He just kept talking. He kept saying, God bless them. Now, I'm not saying that every pastor that leaves the church leaves because of problems. Sometimes God does leave. But those that you see, well, they were here one year, and there one year, and there one year, and there one year. They're just getting there for what they get out of. But it's a hireling. Now, what is a pastor's responsibility? Number one, they watch for yourself. He says to be watchful, to be vigilant. My responsibility for you, and, and I take this responsibility very seriously for those who are members of my church, I take this very seriously. For those of you who are visiting my church, if you, or I say my church is the fact that I'm the pastor here, not that I own anything, because I own nothing. But if you, if you visit this church... I take it my full responsibility that every time you come, that I have a responsibility to teach you a diet from the Word of God. That's my responsibility. I take that responsibility serious. There, there's five things I set down here, and I'm not going to. I'm just going to comment on and pass them by as much as I can. He says, be, you know, my responsibility as a pastor is to be mindful of the Holy Spirit's work through God's Word. I take the Word of God. I read the Word of God. The Holy Spirit leads me into a, into a message. And I try to preach the message the way that God wants me to preach it. Number two, I, I try to be sensitive to the hurts and pains of, this, uh, uh, of, of God's people. Folks, I realize, I look across the, the auditorium and I see some people with, with sadness in their face. I see people with joy. I see people that, that are hurting. And my responsibility when I pray for you, and sometimes God does reveal uh, some things to me about, uh, about your situation. And, and that's not that I'm going to go blab it out to everybody because that would be wrong but God just has me pray special for you uh, number three uh, to be alert to the problems that could harm the people you realize that there are some things out there some uh, some people out there that are that are wolves in sheep's clothing and their their job is to destroy God's work not build it up uh, uh, number four to be aware of false teachings when I listen to other preachers on the radio or I, I, I speak comments that they make, my responsibility is to, um, is to teach the truth from the Word of God and to teach you what error is. We had uh, one lady, I, I read this, I, I, I think my wife brought it to my attention, that uh, they were out knocking doors yesterday and a, a, uh, a, the person they were talking to was calling them a heretic and all kinds of things, you know, because they were believing something that was not true to the Word of God. You know, my responsibility is to tell you, they're Jehovah's false witness. They don't believe in hell. The Bible speaks clearly of hell. In fact, Jesus talks more of hell than he talks of heaven. They believe that you keep 
selling these Watchtower magazines or passing out these Watchtower magazines, you're just going to keep elevating yourself up to the higher level, and you're going to become like God. That's not in the Bible. That's it. Well, it is in the Bible. It's Genesis chapter three, when Satan says, "Oh, God just doesn't want the best for you," and you, He knows when you eat that fruit, you'll become as gods, plural, little g, knowing good and evil. That's what they teach. Mormons teach that Jesus and Satan and Lucifer, Satan, are brothers. They teach that if you, the number of kids you have elevates you to a higher plane in heaven. That's why Mormons have lots of children. I mean, there, there's a lot of I mean, there's a lot of erroneous erroneous teachings out there, and so. That's my job, to warn you about those things. It's, it's to help you. It's not to hurt you. It's not to be offensive. But what it is is to say, hey, this is what we need to do. Hurtful trends. Hurtful trends. It's my responsibility to say, stay away from that. Back several years ago, uh, they came out with this laughing revival. And people were walking in the church and, <laughs> and they called it a laughing revival. That's all they did was laugh. There was no preaching, nothing. Just people coming to church and start laughing. That is not of God. Those are hurtful trends. This one's free. And if you have tattoos, I understand. You've done it. It's over with. You deal with it. I'm not condemning you for that at all. I had a dream the other night that, that a preacher was trying to con get my son Michael to get a tattoo of a cross with Jesus hanging on it and blood dripping off of it. And he's sitting there, in my, and, and I'm hearing this conversation in my dream. It's just in my dream, believe me. It was my dream. Oh, that's what Christians are doing nowadays. That's what he's telling my son. And I looked at him and I said, no, Christians are not doing that these days. That's a trend. And not only is it a trend, but he's not doing it. They said, well, he's 37 years old. He can make up his own mind. I said, yeah, but he's 37 years old living in my house. Now, I'll be honest with you. My son is not getting that. It's not because I say so. Because he don't like evil. Just like his dad. It ain't happening. But we're happy to that scripture in the Old Testament. that says, no, make no graving on your body. See, what it was in, the, in idolatrous situations, they were car carving themselves up, and they were tattooing themselves up uh, for the pagan god. Now we've brought that into the New Testament church. That was free. Secondly, the pastor must give an account or answer for his teaching, for his doctrines, and for his personal life. I'm going to stand before God one of these days, and I'm going to stand for what I preached. You say, well, you just weren't preaching the word of God. I'm going to answer to that. If I'm teaching something that is not in the Word of God, and that's why I prayed this morning, hey, God, if I'm saying, I don't let me say anything that's not, that is contrary to the Word of God or it's against the Word of God. That's never my goal. That is never my responsibility to do that. My responsibility is to teach the truth of the Word of God as it's written in the Word of God. But you do know that the Bible, you can make the Bible say anything you want to say. Judas went out and hanged himself. Go and do thou likewise. What thou doest, do quickly. Those are all verses from the Bible, and all of them rate, all of them related to Judas himself. So you say, well, Jesus was was uh, was authorizing Judas to go commit suicide and 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 to to do it quickly. And no, that's not because there's a verse over here and a verse over here and a verse over here, and we're trying to put them together. That's what false teachers do. He's not condoning suicide in the least. You have to watch. That's my responsibility as a pastor. To, uh, to my, I'm going to answer for my teaching, for my doctrine, and also for my personal life. Number three, that they may have joy. The responsibility that you have is that we may have joy. You obeying the word of God is going to give me great joy. It really is. When I see a new Christian come in and, and, and they start reading the Bible and they start praying and they start asking lots of questions, I mean, that brings great joy to me. Or when somebody who's been saved for a while says, Preacher, I was reading the Bible the other day, and, and I found this verse. They probably read it a dozen times, but that, that day they found that verse, and it spoke to them, 
and they come and tell me all about it, and it just blesses my heart. It just brings me great joy and great uh, 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 honor to know that you're reading the Word of God and that you're studying the Word of God, and it's being a part of your life. Not only that, it's always a joy to see church, but spiritual growth among the people is evidence. Kenneth Weiss put it this way, you should uh, make the work of your ruler easy and joyful. If you want to, if you want to help me as a pastor, say amen once in a while. I mean, agree once in a while. Because what I see is, not too sure about that one, preacher. Okay, but encourage, strengthen, help. When I see you in this in, in town, you know, if I'm standing behind, this probably isn't going to happen. But if I'm standing two people behind you in Walmart, and I hear you bless out the uh, uh, the clerk up there or griping because somebody's taking too much time, that doesn't bring me joy. Or if I see you in a restaurant somewhere and you're giving the waitress a, a fit, that doesn't bring me joy. That grieves. And that's what he says here. He says that to bring joy uh, to the pastor, but then he says that they may not have grief or uh, not with groaning, not with remorse. One commentator put, it, commentator put it this way. The groaning with which one resumes a thankless task and with which the, he contemplates an unappreciated and even opposed to the work. To not pay attention to your ruler means that you are out of sympathy with them and their teachings and that it can do you, and that can do you no good. Now, J. Vernon McKee put it this way. If your pastor is a man of God who is teaching you the word of God, then you ought to obey the word of God. Let me repeat that. If your pastor is a man of God who is teaching you the word of God, then you are to obey the word of God as he has given it to you. It would be better for you to have not heard the word of God than to hear it and not obey it. With, with, with knowledge comes responsibility. The pastor is not your enemy. I'm not your enemy. Okay? Now, in conclusion, these th these four things right here. Three things. The pastor's responsibility is to bring you to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's my job. Preach the Word of God. If you're unsaved, you hear the Word of God, you ought to respond to the Word of God and come to know Jesus Christ. Secondly, my job is to help you to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why I teach the Word of God. That's why I teach it expositorially. In other words, I go verse by verse, chapter by chapter. That's why it's taking so long to get to the papers. And number three, it's to keep you on the right path so you don't stray. People don't tell me this, but I hear it often from other people. That, you know, have you seen so-and-so? No, I haven't seen them. I can't find them at home. Well, it's not that I can't find them at home. It's the store when I get there. But, well, yeah, I talked to them the other day, and they said that they just weren't getting fed. Just not getting fed. They told me recently about a person like that, and uh, I said, well, number one, in order to, in order to get fed, you got to go to the table once in a while. In other words, you need to be in the house of God. Three times, three to thrive. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, three to thrive. You ought to be in church. But if you're not getting fed, it's your own fault. It's because you're being called, but you're not responding. Number two, you're not listening. Okay? I spread the table, and I work on spreading the table all week long. When I get here, you ought to get something out of it. If I, if I don't say anything that sparks your interest or sparks your, uh, your, uh, your desire to look up something and find out, the Holy Spirit of God is at work. And the Holy Spirit of God is going to bring you to that truth, uh, uh, to a truth that you need. So, you, I mean, you can't say, well, there, there's nothing laid on the table. I will guarantee you one thing. My wife and my son cook. When they say it's time to eat, both my son and myself are standing there at the island waiting to fix our plates. My wife's an awesome cook. My son's getting Worked on the younger one. But anyway. 
there's always something on the table to eat. Now, we may not like everything. Every once in a while, there gets to be broccoli. You give me broccoli raw, and I'll eat it until it just is gone. But you put it in a pan and you boil it, you just will feed it to the dog. I don't like it. Now, I will eat it. I don't like it, but it's on the table. Okay, because sometimes when you come to the house of God, sometimes there's some things you just really don't like. But they're beneficial. Okay? Now then, my job, number four, really, is to pray for you. That the Holy Spirit would lead you into whatever decision that you need to make. And I've prayed all week long. I've had some folks that are supposed to be here today. That I pray for. I have someone call me and say, I, "Would you please pray for?" Me? I pray for all of you. That's why I say, I, I look at this section. I say, "Okay, those people were here, and these people were here, and, and you get up this section, you move over to that section." And I say, "Well, was Brenda here today?" And they go, "Yeah, she was here." Well, I didn't see her because I'm used to looking over there and seeing Brenda. And if she goes over there, I may not recognize she's over there. Okay, so you may not get prayed for if you move around too much. Just kidding. But honestly and truthfully, as I look across the auditorium, in my mind's eye, when I'm praying for you, I look across the auditorium, I can just about see you like the creatures of habit. Know where you're sitting. You might be sitting two rows back or two rows forward. You might be sitting on one end or the other, but you're in that section. And I know you. And I pray for you. And I go through that list. I've prayed all week long. God, help this individual. The Lord just their person is a burden right now. They're not sharing. I need to be sensitive to that. That's my job. My job is to get you to the place that you have such an intimate relationship with Lord Jesus Christ that to not read His Word, to not pray, you'd be remorseful. Because that's where you come. You get trials, you get tests. That's where you, you need to know the Lord's right there with you. Don't wait until the storm comes before you start praying. Do it now. Let's stand for prayer. Father, we thank you tonight. We bless our morning for your blessing. We thank you, Lord, for what you've done for us and for what you've given us. Lord, I just thank you for the word of God. I thank you, Lord, that I had uh, uh, mentors and I had preachers. I had uh, men of God that I could look back and study the word of God and, and know, uh, Lord, what the Bible teaches. It's helped me to grow. And even to this very day, I'm learning more and more and more. Uh, the word of God is quick. It's powerful. Every single day, so high. Lord, I, I get today what I need today from the Word of God. Father, I pray that you bless the invitation that you speak to our hearts. Lord, if there's somebody here that does not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior for life, Father, I pray that they not leave this, leave this service without you. Lord, if there's somebody here this morning, they're saved, that their hearts are full, that they come to an altar and do business with you if they need to pray with you. Lord, if, there, if, there's, if you laid somebody on, the, on someone's heart that needs to be saved, Lord, I pray that they follow the altar, come to the altar, and just pray for them. Father, give 